The city of Indianapolis boasts of a rich and impactful legacy from its African-American community. One of the most important influencers that helped shape and inform Blacks of Indianapolis was the Senate Avenue YMCA. Black history here in Indianapolis is, is a history of a resilient people, of a determined people, of people who were full of faith, and people who were willing to work. For me, being a young black male from Indianapolis, Indiana, I'm gonna look at our history and how people like me were living a decade ago, a century ago, two centuries ago here in my hometown of Indianapolis. And so that's kind of where the passion for the black history started, but I've always had a passion for history because I feel like it connects and explains everything. It explains why the name of the street is the name of the street, why the name of the church is the name of the church. By the name of the school is the name of the school. You've got to know history to figure out these things. And so, as I've always loved connecting things to history, when I start to tell my story, I'm black, so that story is going to look and have a little more melanin than most stories that you've maybe seen historically. <laughs> the story of blacks in Indiana begins prior to the Civil War, when a modest number of black families lived mostly in rural settlements. After the Civil War, African Americans found Indianapolis to be a promising location to raise a family, find work, and if fortunate, launch a business. In Indianapolis, prior to the Civil War, you had less than 500 black residents. By 1900, you're at 15,931. So you can see, see this growth. It grew exponentially in that time. 3,000% is is about where, where it was from 1860 to 1900. And then inside Indianapolis, uh, this huge black community uh, you know, around Indiana Avenue uh, grew up and um, just offered a lot of opportunity. From this growing African-American community, there were a number of black visionaries who would not only impact the local community, but the nation as well. Indianapolis was attractive to her because of the logistical advantage it offered in terms of being access more parts of the country. Even now we talk about Indianapolis and Indiana as kind of the crossroads of America. It had that same kind of advantage at that point. And there was uh, the black business community here was fairly strong too. And if we think about her history as kind of this, this orphaned, widowed, migrant uh, who is struggling with a sense of home as America is changing and, and Jim Crow is being erected, even even after you know, um, emancipation from slavery, it, it speaks to why Indianapolis becomes a special place for her. The black population of Indianapolis witnessed a number of positive assets around the community, but that community still faced the obstacles and limitations brought on by segregation and racism. When uh, the black community couldn't access, um, you know, the things that make your life whole, they obviously were going to uh, start their own and create their own community, things that they would have access to. Historically, this is really an era of institution building among African Americans. And even though Jim Crow is at its height and lynchings are all around, the segregation is severe, there's desolate opportunities, African Americans are building their own institutions. And obviously it started with the church even you know, before that, but during this time frame, this early 20th century time frame, you have lots of civil rights organizations being founded. The NAACP is founded during this time, the National Urban League, lots of schools, the Divine Nine, the historic uh, collegiate African American fraternities and sororities. So around the country, African Americans are building their own institutions, supporting them. In 18 1944, 22-year-old farmer and London, England resident George Williams was deeply concerned about the dangers and unrest young boys faced in the tough streets in the city. Williams assembled 11 other men to launch the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, to create a refuge of Bible study and prayer for young men seeking escape from the hazards of life on the streets. In 1851, a retired sea captain from Boston, Thomas Valentine Sullivan, had heard about the positive impact of the YMCA in London and created the first American YMCA to help young boys have a home away from home. 
the Y was founded on um, uh, Christian principles. And basically, it was a way to help young boys at the time, because Young Men's Christian Association, that's what the YMCA stands for, um, and to have them, the young boys to be able to have a Christian faith-based life. And so one way that you do that is through different activities, um, but it really just served the community. In the 1900s, of course, there was complete segregation in Indianapolis. There were doctors and lawyers, people who were of some means, and decided that there were just so many young men getting into trouble, and they were sort of loitering and, and uh, with not much to do. There weren't enough jobs to go around and so on, and they decided that they needed to do something about that. And that was when the spark of the idea of having something like the YMCA. And so the YMCA eventually sent someone here to look the city over and see what the situation was and see if they indeed were serious about having a YMCA. And that was kind of the beginning of it. And uh, the reason, of course, was that there were no resources available for African Americans in Indianapolis. And they just didn't have anything to do, any place to go. Jobs were scarce and so on. And that was the beginning of it. The memberships of the Senate Avenue YMCA outpaced the facilities. It was decided that a new building was needed to best serve its patrons. And Madam Walker actually provided a leadership gift for that campaign. In 1911, she pledged $1,000, which was a, a huge amount of money for that campaign. And she ended up being heralded as kind of the largest black giver to that movement during that time frame. And the key thing that she said about it, she said, if we can build this uh, YMCA, right, then that will lead to a YWCA to help our women and girls. And that's what she was really interested in. Um, and so, and lo and behold, after, you know, that Y gets built, um, Madam Walker becomes a part of the committee that's trying to bring the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA to Indianapolis so black women and girls can benefit. And unfortunately, she passes away before it gets built, but it does get built and it ends up serving. So in many ways, her vision did come true. The first, the, the YMCA was built, and then that leveraged into the YWCA. Julius Rosenwald, who was a, a, a he ran Sears Roebuck, he read Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. And that book moved him so much because as a, as a persecuted Jew, and he was the son of poor immigrants from Germany, he could empathize with what the black community was going through. And so I think he helped build over 5,000 schools. In fact, at one time, his schools were educating at least a third of the Southern blacks in the United States. And he also helped Booker T to establish the Tuskegee Institute and was a board member and a supporter of that. So um, Jesse Moreland was the black man at the uh, Y who was developing the black YMCAs around, around the country. And he connected with Rosenwald to do the, the one in Chicago. And so he got um, Rosenwald to agree to do a match. And so basically the buildings were about $100,000 to build. And so the, the idea was if the community would raise 75% Rosenwald would provide a 25% match. And so as they were getting the Chicago one going, Moreland talks Rosenwald into expanding to other cities where they could do this. And so that opens up the chance for Indianapolis. And so the, the campaign was this mix of, this kind of this, this, um, this collaborative but segregated effort. There, <laughs> there were white fundraising committees and there were black fundraising committees and they could only solicit people from their own race. Um, but together, they had to raise about $80,000 and then that would pull down Rosenwald's match. And so they did it. You know, they set up on this, they set off on this fundraising campaign and just 10 days later, they had raised all the money they needed, which to put that in perspective, $75,000 in uh, 1916 money, or sorry, 1911 money, is about $2 million today or a little under $2 million today. So. That's a lot of money to be raised in just 10 days. So the grand opening was in 1913, and it was a big affair. Uh, lots of coverage, lots of interest. 
Um, there were reportedly hundreds of people outside trying to get in and over a thousand inside. Um, and one of the highlights was that Booker T. Washington was one of the featured speakers. And so when Madam Walker learned that, she invited him to stay with her when he came to the city. And he accepted. And so she was very excited about that. Uh, she had been trying to connect with him for many years and, and he had kind of kept her at a distance, but now she was gonna host him at her home. And so she went all out as only Madam could. She sent her car and her chauffeur to pick him up from Union Station downtown and drive him around town. And they were able to arrive to the event in classic, you know, fashionable style. And Madam Walker's right there in the mix. Um, and there is that famous photo where she's standing next to him on the stairs with George Knox and Freeman B. Ransom and others. And you have George Knox. Well, George Knox had come to Indiana. He came here from Tennessee. He had been born a slave. He was in Greencastle and he was a barber and then he would come to Indianapolis and he would also um, serve as a barber here as well. But then he was a publisher of the Freeman. He is in that picture. So what that represents, you know, coming from being born a slave, coming here as a barber, and then becoming a publisher of a newspaper here in Indianapolis. Um, there were reportedly hundreds of people outside who wanted to get in. There were a thousand people inside as a part of the audience, black and white audience. Um, and it was, it was just a big affair, a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. Um, Charles Fairbanks, who was the U.S. Senator from Indiana and the former uh, Vice President under Teddy Roosevelt, was there. He introduced Booker T. Washington. Washington spoke and was very complimentary of the effort and said that this would help develop black Indianapolis. Um, and so it was, it was just a big affair. One of the unique features of the Senate Avenue YMCA was the Monster Meeting, which were public forums held on Sunday afternoons for the young men. The, the Monster Meeting started as, as, a, as a, an evangelistic outreach to, to young, young black men. And Thomas E. Taylor brought pastors in, businessmen that had faith, uh, to talk to them about their character, about their own faith, about what was really important, their purpose, you know, why God created them. At first he was going to call it the big meeting, but then um, he got kind of uh, shot down for that from the central YMCA because they already had a meeting called the big meeting that was like their annual big meeting that uh, kind of brought uh, everybody in from the state. So instead of that, he kind of one up, one up them and called them monster meetings instead, which kind of fortuitous because they went on to become really monster meetings. I mean, some of them were so big that they wouldn't even fit at the Senate Avenue YMCA. They would have to have them at uh, local theaters and um, some of them just drew a huge crowd. The most instrumental leader who impacted the growth and innovation of the Senate Avenue YMCA was Fayburn de France. He would lead the Y for over 35 years. Mr. de France became the executive director of the YMCA in 1916. He came from Kansas in 1913 as a physical director. Then in 1916, he became the director. But the France was the, sort of the power broker, the one who decided that uh, blacks in Indianapolis needed to know what was going on. The city needed to have some uh, uh, strength to uh, persuade the legislators to pass some laws that would help African Americans. He became much more powerful than he had been before because he had gotten some backing from other people from around the state and from around the country. He was called Chief. So nobody called him Mr. DeFrance. Everybody called him Chief. One of the things about the Sending Avenue Y is that at one point it had the largest membership for uh, membership of black members of Ys in the United States. That is very significant. This is taking place here in Indianapolis. So the monster meetings were forums, were meetings, were gatherings of important conversation and discussion about issues and events that were taking place that directly related to the black experience here in Indianapolis and throughout the country. You know, the monster meeting started off as just a, uh, under Mr. Taylor, a local, mostly religious uh, meeting. And uh, DeFrance was the one who switched it over to something that was more political. There were movie stars, politicians, um, there were uh, administrators at universities around the country. 
And uh, so there was no stopping the number of people who came. And there was no particular gr group of people who came. They were from all walks of life. They brought together um, national leaders and local leaders, but they were speaking on issues that were important to the black community here in Indianapolis and across the country. And very early history here in Indianapolis for these meetings. Some of the individuals who came to speak here included Olympian Jesse Owens, included poet County Cullen, who came here in 1927. You had Dr. Charles Drew, who came here in 1948, and he talked about the state of Negro health and looking at that. And you had um, artist Hale Woodruff, who came and actually worked at the YMCA at the Sinning Avenue YMCA, and then would um, enroll in the John Heron School of Art and would become an acclaimed artist. You would have individuals like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who would speak here in 1958. And although I have not been able to find his complete speech, um, there are snippets of the things that he said in the Indianapolis Recorder. The famed attorney Thurgood Marshall, and he spoke about what was taking place in Little Rock. He asked, you know, the audience to think about how long shall these kids be carrying the weight of the world, essentially. And he encouraged them that when you lose courage, that you need to think about those students and what they were doing as as a way to provide you encouragement. And there were other individuals like F. B. Ransom. Um, Freeman Ransom, who was the attorney uh, for Madam Walker, and he spoke. He spoke about Negro unemployment. You had Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who was the president of Howard University, who spoke on numerous occasions, um, beginning in 1926 when he started as president of Howard University. And sometimes women spoke as well. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt spoke here in 19, spoke at a monster meeting in 1953. And those monster meetings, I mean, some of them had been held in um, local theaters because they just drew so many people that they couldn't fit them in the Y. And you would see, you know, 1,500 people come, which is, you know, an incredible number for a, a YMCA activity. I think that a lot of YMCAs would love to see those numbers coming through their doors. <laughs> I hope people realize that there's so much more um, to themselves, to their city, to its history than what they may have been taught or may have always understood. We can always look and discover more. There's at the Senate Avenue um, marker, the historical marker, the back of the sign mentions the names of George Washington Carver, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Martin Luther King, Eleanor Roosevelt. Those are on the back of the sign. So if you just drive by and look at the front of the sign, you may not even you may not even know those people came there. So just by simply looking at the back, you can see more. And then maybe you go online and you Google some stuff and you find out more. It, like if you jump into Charles DeBow, just as an example, here's a kid who's born in 1918, this, so, so just after the Senate Avenue YMCA was built. Um, he grew up in the Senate Avenue YMCA. We have, you know, I have a picture of him receiving a, a youth award. So you can see the mentorship of all of this piecing together. Now De France becomes mentor to DeBow. Now fast forward, DeBow applies to become a Tuskegee Airman. He's now selected as one of 13 throughout the nation to go to training. He's one of only five to finish. He then becomes an instructor pilot. So, and as an F-15 instructor, you know, I, I probably trained 200 students. And Debo, over the, the year and a half that he was an instructor pilot, he trains all the next Tuskegee Airmen in advanced flight training. But not only that, but his education now helps to educate them. His influence on what his perspective was now influences them. So you trace all that back to raising a child like Debo in Indianapolis with these people, like the ripples of that. I mean, it's such a significant perspective of jumping into this young man's like community and realizing the steps that it took to get him to where he was and the influence that he had and then ultimately the actions that were taken, which are all for righteousness. And the monster meeting would generally have maybe a thousand people, maybe more. And they would uh, talk about these issues before this large audience. And they knew that in this audience, there were representatives from every club, 
every organization in the city. And they, of course, would, that's the way they spread information. And these people would take this information back to their particular groups. And that's how some of the activism started. And so when you read about uh, some church that's uh, pressuring the legislature to do something, generally the germ of that idea came from the monster meeting or from one of the speakers at the monster meeting. And so they, they pushed to, uh, uh, for the discrimination at Indiana University to open up the housing at Indiana University, the same for Purdue. They pushed to, um, uh, and DeFrance was leading most of these efforts to get uh, uh, Indiana University to accept uh, black athletes. And Bill Garrett, of course, was the first to play at Indiana University and became an All-American, actually, at, at IU. And so they were doing these kinds of things, and these things spread throughout the city, throughout the state, and actually throughout the country. And uh, so I think we can lay much of that responsibility at the feet of the uh, uh, Senate Avenue YMCA. There was actually an arm to the meetings that was uh, a committee that kind of um, talked about uh, legislation that was going to affect the black community. So anytime a piece of legislation was going to come through, they would have a forum that was open to the public that uh, discussed, that had a speaker that would discuss the legislation that was pending. And then people could ask questions, become more uh, educated on it, and then, you know, presumably uh, lobby their uh, legislative rep representative one way or the other. So that was one way in which they really encouraged community activism. And really, um, in general, the I think having these national figures come in and talk about these big issues uh, that were then being reflected in the local community, they were usually going to include a call to action. By the 1970s, Indianapolis was becoming more integrated. Black families lived throughout the city, not just in the centralized location of downtown Indianapolis. Integration helped foster progress for both black and white communities, but in ways it adversely affected some of the black institutions of Indianapolis. But one of the things that happened was that as we began uh, integrating, you know, people found other things to do. And these people began moving out as housing began to open up, as uh, work situations began to open up, people began to move away from the canal. And uh, the interest as more and more people moved to Indianapolis, you know, it was one of the cities where this migration from the south, Indianapolis received uh, many, many black families from the south. And so things just began to change. The legacy of the Senate Avenue YMCA continues in the Ortho Indy Foundation YMCA. And in 2019, it was decided to bring the monster meetings back to the community. When the concept of bringing back monster meetings was first presented to me, uh, you know, I had to think through how do you honor what was created and what, what, what occurred, you know, back in the, you know, 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, because you don't want to dishonor it. You know, you want to do it in a way that respects and appreciates the history and the role that the YMCA played during that time. And I think we also recognize that we're dealing with a new set of challenges today. They may look similar, but there's, there's new things about them. And there's an absolute opportunity for us as a YMCA to be a part of the solution, to bring people together in our communities, to build community. Um, you know, I've heard monster meetings referred to as mass education events. And I think, you know, I think mass education is just as important today as it was back when monster meetings first occurred. You know, turn the TV today, the same things they're talking about right now are the same things that they're talking about in those monster meetings. It was a way to get our community together and realize that we have the power to make change. And the national spotlight is coming on Indianapolis. So, very excited about bringing back the monster meetings and now that the Ortho Indy Foundation YMCA is established because of the Senate Avenue, Fall Creek, and, and Pike YMCA. It's just perfect timing for, for us to bring the monster meetings back, which will, this year, our, our subject is uh, racial reconciliation. 
And so it's just, it fits perfectly. And when you talk about, you know, what the why has been to a community, what the why is to the African American community, the why I think is always looked at as a safe place, safe haven for youth, a place where they can come, where they can gather, where they can play sports, where they can socialize, learn new skills. The Y, of course, also caters to families. So one of the challenges in our YMCA movement is we do so many things, and that there are certain, certain things that are so visible that, that people connect our work solely with gym and swim, solely with resident camp or summer camp, or where your kids come to, to get involved in activities. And they don't always appreciate or recognize the broader role of the YMCA in really being a convener of community bringing people together uh, to take on big challenges and make a big difference.